very much. Mark's covered some of it. Um, and I'm going to fill in some of the blanks and talk about what the future uh, holds. Um, but I'd just like to preface this by, by saying uh, this effort's been really ongoing since 2006 when it first started. Uh, it was formalized a few years ago, resulting in some of the output that Mark just described. But there's been many people involved, uh, very positively, uh, the utilities in particular. And uh, Debbie Bradshaw is here from OUC, and she's kind of behind the scenes conscious with some of the stuff that, that we do. And thank you, Debbie, for that. And Joanne Jackson uh, with the City of Altamont Springs has also been very helpful. But I would also like to point out uh, Tom Bartall, who just retired last year, led a lot of the effort in pulling together the regional water supply plan. I'll make some other comments related to that in the, in the, in the discussion. And Hal Wilkening, uh, who's very creative in developing kind of innovative projects. Hal was here somewhere. Um, yes, and so you can't escape them. He also just retired. He was really instrumental in making the progress that we, that we have. <coughs> So I was going to say, what is CFWI? Who doesn't? Well, you already know. You just got the. But what's that equation? Does he recognize that equation? We'll come back to that. If you tell me what that is, then you get a your registration comp. That's what I'm told by FWDA. Um, Mark described this, but again, there's over a hundred around a hundred utilities uh, within the footprint of this five-county area. Two point seven million people, three water management districts. Uh, so you can imagine. Uh, how uh, in, involved <coughs> it, it is. Um, it is the home of the headwaters of seven uh, major river systems in the CFWI, uh, hence the boundaries of the water management districts, or, which are organized around the surface water drainages. And as Mark mentioned before, you know, over 33% of the surface area is uh, natural resources. Uh, this is kind of a picture of the upper Florida um, 2012, it's roughly 120 feet, about four feet on the west coast. It goes down to the St. John's, which is about, I think, 16 feet. Uh, and therein lies the great resource in central Florida, and therein lies the challenge, because that's been our historic source of very high quality, cheap drinking water and water for our natural system. The flows from the high to the low. Uh, and this is a depiction of that area. I'm just, we're going to do a cross section. I just want to just point out how sensitive it is. Uh, on this graphic is the footprint of the CFWI and also the footprint of the uh, Swaka area, as, as a, in addition to the, um, the most impacted area in, in Swaka. Uh, and I would say anybody who's not in Swaka but within the CFWI footprint would pay attention to what developed in the development of the Swaka rules as kind of a go look ahead of how these may these may evolve. So, so a cross section of the upper Florida, you know, looks like this, and it doesn't take a rocket science hydrogeologist uh, to understand, oops, the, the line's off a little bit here, but roughly that's that's the boundary of the district, 120. <laughs> feet in elevation, excuse me, metric head. It's very much regulated on one side, and it's kind of not been on the other side uh, as much, and that therein lies the challenge of the three districts having three different approaches to, to managing that, and we're just beginning the process to kind of can, you know, consolidate, consolidate that. As Mark showed earlier, um, again, the areas that are most susceptible as, if, as we continue to draw down the upper Florida and, uh, to impacts on the surface water. Uh, the Swaka area, the Lake Wales Ridge, Southern Lake County, um, Western Orange County, and, and the Wakaiba area all happens to be uh, the areas where most of the growth is going to occur, you know, going, going forward. So I'm just trying to summarize in just a couple of comments. What do we accomplish with the publishing of the uh, CFWI plan in 2015 before we talk about going forward. Um, a couple of things. We, through Mark's leadership on some of the work he did, we now have a regional planning level of sustainable groundwater <coughs> in that bubble. And I want to emphasize it's regional and it's planned. It's not a regulatory standard, it's just a, it's just a starting point to talk about 
as we look forward over the next 20 years, uh, what what kind of resource are we are we dealing with? Um, it's everybody agrees with with the numbers that have come out with that. That's going to get refined as we go forward. Uh, and if I don't say it's emphasized enough, planning, planning, planning. It's not a regulatory standard. A lot of times, uh, are any lawyers in this room? Okay, well, they tend to not look at numbers in a planning framework as much as uh, as, a, as a regulatory uh, framework. So that that. Secondly, uh, under Tom Bartol's leadership, we have a single unified regional water supply plan for all three water management districts serving this area within that footprint. Um, took a lot of effort to do that. Uh, Tom was very calm and fatherly on the outside, and I'm sure he had to be different on the inside because uh, we, we wouldn't have gotten there. Taking three plans off in three directions, pulling it together, um, it's, uh, it was a very big effort, and Tom, thank you again for, for your leadership on that. Going forward and updating, now that we have a single plan, it's going to be much easier, much more understandable for everybody uh, going forward. We also have a regional consensus, and I mean region, with all the participants in the region, the stakeholders in the region, of what we got to do going forward, and that's what I'm going to get into. And we also have a framework for this regional cooperation. I just want to tell you that the region is not just the CFWI. Uh, some of the long-term projects perhaps could impact downstream users in the St. Johns River. So the region, the, the Exo region, if you will, it includes uh, up, upper, the lower St. Johns downstream and upper St. Johns in St. Lucie County because there's a project proposed there. So, Debbie, did I miss anything? I, I did? Oh, okay, okay. See, I told you she takes care of me on all of these. I, people think I spell really well and punctuate things perfectly, and that's only because Debbie uh, corrects it every time. So, let's look at the next five, year, and next five years, and this, the theme of this conference, One Drop of Water, Many Uses, I think it's going to have very good um, opportunity uh, in, this, in this effort. This is, this is working fantastic. I, I don't, So this is what drives the world in Florida. Um, even though we had a recession and things went to hell in a handbasket, it seems like for about a three or four year period, we thought that was the end of Florida. There was even a headline in the Wall Street Journal back in 2006, is Florida over? And it talked about, it's, it's over. It doesn't look over from this. And, and this is the Bieber uh, population projections, uh, kind of conservative projections going forward to 2035. And whatever happened in here, it, it's, it doesn't show up. Um, so that drives everything. And, and it's the responsibility of the water management districts to protect existing users, to make water available for all future users, and of course, protect the natural resources. And the big challenge they have is how do you balance all that? Just Mark showed this, this graphic. Um, he didn't say that something magical happened when we start planning again, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. That's, that's one of the data points that I think we have some uh, um, concern about going forward from some of the communities. Overlays the population growth with the water use. And again, it was relatively flat in this 15 year period. Central Florida grew by over a million people, but the aggregate water use in that 15 year period didn't go up at all. Now some of that was, we have a rain period, so that, that depressed the usage. A lot of it was the great conservation efforts that agriculture has undertaken, and especially the public utilities have done a fabulous job with that. But what they've done is not well understood, which is another problem which we'll talk about. Again, Mark's graphic to summarize, population's gonna grow, We've identified through this process over 400 million gallons of new water and the need going forward of 300 for new water. Uh, 50 of that 300 might come from the remaining water in the planning uh, amount in the, uh, in the aquifer. The rest of it is gonna be alternative supplies. And this, 
Now there's so much data in the plan, you can slice and dice it a, a gazillion ways. I just thought I would just show you uh, this, this amount. This is the delta between the water use from 2010 to 2035, roughly 300 million. And again, the numbers are off just a little bit. I, I remind you they're planning numbers, okay? They're rounding numbers. They're a slice in time one year. It doesn't get updated the next year, but it's it's in the ballpark and it's good for the discussion purposes. Uh, roughly 300 million of new water, two thirds of that's from public supply, and it breaks out by the different geographic uh, areas. So if somebody asked a question about agriculture, the delta, um, roughly 30 million gallons of, of new of new water, most of that in, in the South Florida area. And I'm assuming. Um, that we'll have these presentations available for everybody uh, so that you can get So now, that's kind of back between what Mark said and what I'm saying. Now we're gonna go forward. Um, I wanna emphasize that everything I say from here to the end is draft. It's draft because, and I'll, I'll explain what it means in just a second, uh, we have a steering committee uh, who oversees this effort. Um, they haven't made this decision to kind of approve the draft concepts that we're gonna talk about yet. So that meeting is next Friday, a week from today, uh, at Toho Water. They'll, they'll consider these things and make some decisions and go, go forward with this. So I'm a little premature, but every slide should have draft. So I didn't, I didn't put it on every slide, but everything from here on is all is all draft, okay? So that'll keep me out of trouble if I get okay. okay. So going forward the next five years, how are we gonna do this? We're gonna have a governance framework that was similar to how we handled in the past. And I'll explain what that means in a second, how these decisions are gonna get made. Um, we had a steering committee, which was part of the governance and oversaw this effort. And at the end of the last effort, they made some motions of, as far as what they'd like to see done uh, in a more timely manner. Uh, and we're gonna incorporate that in this, in this particular document. Uh, the documents themselves outline 12 next steps that need to be taken. And just yesterday, uh, the water bill was passed, uh, signed, was passed last week, signed by the governor yesterday, so it's in effect. And there's about two pages in that water bill that memorialize the prior efforts in, C, in C, the CFWI. It puts uh, kind of an anchor in the ground that says everything that was done before is now in law, and everything going forward is a process that, that really reinforces what I'm gonna talk to you today. Now, is that, does that mean everything you did before would be legal? No. <laughs> did did you, lawyers yes. Sure. Uh, what it means to me is the fact that losses don't happen on, on their own. I mean, there was general consensus by everybody that this was a good process, the work was very good. It's now been codified in, in, in statute. If the agriculture community didn't like it, it wouldn't have passed. If the public utility community didn't like it, it wouldn't have passed. If the environmental community, they said they didn't like it, but they really liked it, okay? <laughs> it wouldn't have passed. The environmental community, it was good, and privately, but in public, well, it could have been better, okay? So we can all do things better, and, and this effort's gonna try to make it even better. But it passed, and it's been signed by the governor on moving forward. So, the document, that I would call your attention to uh, is this guidance document. It lays out the scope of work of F the, the efforts going forward. Um, what they're gonna consider next week is to approve some of the general framework of that, and we'll come back and we'll fill in some of the details and I'll explain what that is. So it all starts with guiding principles. What are we trying to accomplish? Three of these four were in the prior effort, the 2015 effort. How much groundwork, planning level estimates of groundwork are there? Mark, 850, planning. We're gonna update that. Is, is it 900? Debbie, maybe it's over 600. We got a, we got a real problem, so probably not. Uh, we're gonna monitor strategies to meet those demands. The, the plan made recommendations on improvements uh, to eke out more water. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. I made some recommendations, we're gonna monitor that. Um, the one thing we did not accomplish and I think, Mark, this is to your question about uh, established consistent rules. 
Um, we, have, we don't have consistent rules yet. We understand each other's rules much better, why that came about. We have a consistent law, but the application of the laws that evolved over the last you know, 30 years were all specific to a certain area as they kind of came together in Central Florida. They're, they diverged just a little bit, so there's an effort to kind of bring those back together. In fact, the law that just got signed by the governor yesterday requires DEP by December 31st, 2016, this year, to initiate rulemaking. That means they, they initiate rulemaking. Okay, so. <laughs> about noon, I'm not going to say that part. <laughs> and then finally, a new, uh, a new principle was added to the process to encourage funding. None of this stuff works if we don't make a commitment to you know, build some of these things in place. And the most important thing Mark hit on a little before is we do not have enough real-time data about the resource that we're trying to protect, that we're trying to develop, that we're trying to manage. Um, so there's some strong recommendations to enhance that network to understand that resource better, and hopefully that, that gets funded. There's also, within this overall document, some goals that we've laid out and all of these are verbatim out of the current law that was signed by the governor yesterday. And some of it's just repetitive, but, it, but again, it's in law. A single planning model. And we're going to update that model by December 31st, 2017, as requested by the steering committee. And again, it's a planning model. Uh, there's plans to expand the uh, the modeling boundary to, uh, to the West Coast, and this long-term desire for that planning model to perhaps become a regulatory model one day. Uh, a lot more work has to be done, and a lot more data, good data, has to go into that model to, uh, to make that work. Um, so we have a lawyer in the back of the room. She's a not <laughs> Yes, okay. She's familiar with this term, uh, but this is the crux of the disconnect and a lot of the regulatory things is how this, is, how this uh, term of art, harmful to water resources, is, uh, is interpreted. And that basically sets the standard as far as how much water can be withdrawn in a, in a, in a particular area. Um, but again, that, that, is, that work is ongoing right now. A single reference condition, a single process for permit reviews, a single process, a single process, a single everything. So, so this is the governance structure. You, you saw some of the earlier graphics of how we're organized. Just want to go through this a sec. There is a steering committee where the public provides input into that. Uh, under the Sunshine <coughs> Law, rules of the state, this is the, the Sunshine body. All these are technical committees un under those. Uh, they do not make decisions. They develop options. They analyze technical data. They make uh, options to the steering committee who makes the final decision. And we'll talk about each one of these, uh, what they're going to accomplish. The steering committee is a cross-section of members uh, in the area. Brian Wheeler uh, from the Tuffle Water Authority, three governing board members, Steve Linnell from the Department of Agriculture is the new Office of Water Policy Director. And the new chair is going to speak this afternoon, Ryan Matthew. Uh, he's with uh, DEP. The, I I, this is not the final, final presentation because there's some, we're missing some, some graphics. I was going to go back and forth to this, but I'll, I'll explain it. So we have a steering committee, and these are all other committees. There are one, two, there's five committees that report to the oversight committee, which reports through the steering committee. And all the technical work that's going to happen occurs within each of these committees. Um, Mark talked about the modeling, the data collection. Mark's going to head up this committee, uh, and we'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk through that. So the steering committee, the management oversight committee, the uh, added a, a member from the environment uh, from the Sierra Club, excuse me, from the Nature Conservancy is going to sit on this 
this committee. Robert Beltran is going to chair that from the Water Management District, Jeff Flipma. The different teams, the conservation team, uh, the person has not been named. Uh, there's a regulatory team, Len Lindahl from South uh, Florida, and that's where the big decision on uh, the whole permitting standards is going to occur. An update of the plan, uh, Tammy Bader is going to take over for, for Tom Barkall and, and bring that up to date. The water resource assessments, this is all the science and technology, all the real hard stuff. Mark Hammond's going to going to deal with that, and then we're adding a communication outreach to explain this a little bit better to, uh, to, to everybody for their understanding. The conservation team. Now, what's proposed to be adopted uh, next week by the steering committee is the basic charge for that committee, and each of these committees are going to start to meet and write a scope of work of what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, who's responsible for getting it done. Uh, so the charge for the conservation team uh, over the next five years is to continue to advance the effort to move conservation beyond what's targeted in the plan. The target in the plan is 37 million gallons of additional conservation. They think they'd be increased and to develop some goals uh, consistent with the water supply plan. The disconnect on the per capita, um, this is the gross per capita demand in Central Florida since 1995, 200 down to about 150. Uh, but we're, you know, the happiest place on earth with Disney and all the communities, so, and big agriculture. So you tease out of that data, the residential per capita, and they've made great strides from around 160 down to slightly under 100. Uh, the question is, you know, how much lower can you go? Uh, and it's, some utilities are at the bottom, some, some, some aren't, so we're going we're gonna to see what can be done there. And kudos to all the utilities and what they've done. And this graphic is the 850 line that we can get out of, the, out of our groundwater resource. Everything that's needed above that is going to have to come from an alternative source. And that's going to be the big challenge. Obviously, the utilities and the ag community and the self suppliers are all incented to use whatever water they have as, as best as they can. The regulatory team developed a consistent rule framework. The regional water supply planning team. Um, one of the questions that came in the adoption of, of these plans by the water management districts, um, some of the data it takes so long to collect and by the time you make a decision to move forward, it seems like it's out of date by the time you adopt it. We're using, some of these data was 2013 data. We just had 2015 data, but blah, 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 blah. So we're gonna update it based on 2015 data and 2017, it's still gonna be out of date. But the, the question is, that trend that's been flat, you know, have we reached the bottom? Is, is all the low hanging fruit in our conservation happened? Or, or does it continue to go down? Mark showed this graph, and this is the latest data was 2013, so it's played out to 15. I'm, Mark, it's not much different, it's still, it's still flat. Um, we're gonna support as part of the project going forward, additional projects, and this is where the one the one more uh, kind of concept comes in. These are the projects that are in the plan. There's 150 projects that are in the regional water supply plan. These are some of them. Um, to me, the most, some of the most exciting ones are coming out of the stormwater. Stormwater, not only as a source for potable, as a source for irrigation, but I think as a source to mitigate some of the impacts that have already occurred. And we're starting to develop projects along along that. The reclaim, we're pretty much tapped out of what we can do with reclaim. Uh, however, there's going to be a transition from, from irrigation of that water to more recharge of that water, and maybe there's even a pro pilot project that was thrown out right at the end to do a direct potable, uh, and that's going to come back. The, there's lots of projects that all fall into this area. I would just encourage you to look at the plan. Mark showed this graphic. These are all the projects all the money uh, that's laid out over time. Um, I would really pay attention to the first two years, because that's, that's real. Beyond that, it's kind, of, it's kind of high in the sky, the way we budget in Florida. Some of these projects are so massive and gonna take so long, um, and the way we fund things uh, with the water management districts, with the state on a year-by-year -year basis, uh, there's talk about creating more programmatic funding where we can fund multi-year projects 
beyond just one legislative cycle. Um, so the DOT can do it uh, on their major projects, but ought to be able to be done on, 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 on water projects. And again, there's lots of detail to all these projects. Uh, the assessment team, which Mark is going to look at, uh, again, most important thing near term is update that transient model. And again, just to remind you where what we're trying to protect. And then finally, uh, we do a good job communicating with each other. We do a poor job communicating with our elected officials and with the citizens. A lot of times, it's you know early on when there's no crisis, it's hard to get somebody's attention. Uh, an elected that we met with some elected officials early in this process, and they want to know the answer now. So we're just starting this. It's going to take a couple of years. Well, I don't understand why it takes so long. Well, it takes long. So. But we're going to have a separate team that's going to try to um, present this in more understandable fashion for the community. The business community is 100% behind this program. And this is some of the things that they've laid out in their plan. Uh, you can go look at it online. So this is to summarize the next steps that are going to be in this guidance document that are codified in the law. Water conservation, address prevention and recovery, implement those regional solutions, support additional projects, monitor what we're doing, develop consistent rules, communicate better, uh, and then just keep, you know, keep the process uh, rolling forward. Uh, and again, I just put this in, I'm assuming when this will be available, this is just the money that's in the current term. Um, I think I covered this. Same data presented a little bit uh, differently. More of the programmatic work that we're looking for with agriculture and self suppliers uh, to give them some money. And one of the most important things that we're recommending is the Conservation Clearinghouse, which was at the University of Florida, has been funded in a couple of years as kind of a neutral third party that could provide technical data to anybody who needs it on water conservation. When the utilities come forward and present their data, a lot of times it's suspect. Uh, same thing with agricultural community, it's, it's suspect. And we're hoping the clearinghouse can get funded again and they can become a data uh, repository of all this all this data. Mark mentioned the gimmick, and that's the money uh, that's in the plan, not funded, uh, to construct 292 monitoring stations. This was the minimum recommendation that, that the team recommended. They think 900 stations are really needed to do a, to do a good job. That's the optimal number. But uh, they said that at least 292 were needed just to get good data into the model. Garbage in, garbage out. All the assumptions going into the model are, are just estimates, and they're assumptions, and, and you're not, there's not enough real data that's in there. Report back, and that, that's about. Mark mentioned the, <coughs> the two documents, and there's appendices that go with this. Everything's online. Um, I think if you stack everything that's online, print it out, stack it, it, it'd be over my head with, with, with data. And again, there's the link. Uh, and each one of these things are hyperlinked to different, to different activities. And this is going to be kept up. Uh, St. John's manages this website on behalf of all the participants. So I think with that, I'm done. Thank you. Did I miss anything? You did. I did? Yeah. Oh, she'll come later. Yes. John, thanks. That's one of the best, fast summaries of that whole thing I've I've seen. That was outstanding. You had a graph you went through real fast that I didn't get to absorb. It it was showing, I think, what population and actual trends were. Can you show that again? That yeah, to the other way. What's that saying to us? This is population. This is, the top of this is total water use, total average water use in a particular year. And the bars represent different uh, categories, public supply, agriculture, landscape, commercial, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you look at the blue line, that's the public supply line. And the green line is, is agriculture. So over 
this, this graphic, agriculture has gone down a little bit in aggregate and public supply has increased a little bit in aggregate. Um, and I think, does that answer your question? Or? Sort of. Do we know what the trend, and I'm not a Central Florida person, that's why I'm interested in this. Do we know, do we think that trend will stay flat or do we think it'll continue to go down the total water use that we were just seeing there? Well, if we can go back to this, and a lot of it's based on the per capita and the population. And I think when we go in the past, the past is data. Going forward, well, you got to estimate something. So we use Tom. Correct me if I mistake this. Um, kind of the current per capita use times the population that's expected, and you get a number. You know, and it's it, so is is that number going to is the per capita going to stay flat, or is it going to is going to go up? We're going to try to, you know, monitor it and, and get it as low as, as, as is appropriate. Uh, communities that are totally residential have one set of numbers. Communities that have industries in them have a different set of per capita numbers. The Reedy Creek Improvement District doesn't even report data in this graphic because they use a million gallons and they have 12 million people. You know, I'm making that number up. But you, okay. So, um, so there's a, whoops, there's, there's another concept that's in the industry that's starting to just, just happen in California with the big drought they went through in the, in the state, mandated, you know, 25% cuts in water use. Uh, there was a concept called hardened, you know, water use. And I don't know if Texas went, went through that in their drought. I mean, you drive the water use down to a certain amount, and that's it. You know, and to, to, to ask for 25% more, uh, you're not going to get it. You're only going to get it from people that have it, you know, Done, done, the, done the conservation. So there's some discussion about you know how to how to handle that. And I think that my opinion, the best way to handle that is to make all the data available for everybody just to look at. And if Altamont Springs is per capita number is this number in Orange County is a lower number, you should be able to explain why. Okay? So Good presentation. Um, is the funding for this going to, do you think it's going to come through the state or the individual utilities going to fund it? How do you see that? Uh, it's, it, me speaking, it should be everybody. The plan recommends a broad funding base from a lot of different sources. Anything that's specific to a utility need, the utility ought to be able to fund that, and they, and they will. Uh, anything that's regional and a water management district is trying to encourage a certain thing, there's, there's programs in place for the water management districts to help fund some of that. There's also, hasn't been lately, but there ought to be money coming out of the state legislature for general benefits for the, the whole area. Perhaps if we start correcting some of the earlier over drainage that's happened or other things that have happened that we try to create, perhaps there's another pool of money that could, could come from that. And certainly a lot of the regional monitoring that's not specific to any one individual but manage the resource ought to come from a combination, in my opinion, water management districts and you know and, and state funding. So but 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 you know a lot of chicken and egg. You you can't ask for money until you got a plan. You know, you can't implement a plan unless you have some money, so it, it kind of flops back and forth. I think we have a very good plan. The more we can, can keep the community Holding together and speaking with a single voice, the easier it's going to be you know, to fund some of these programs going forward. And this is just a template of what we've done in Central Florida, which I think could apply in other areas of the state as far as how to get regional consensus on, on what to do in the water arena. Uh, anybody practices in the transportation area, there's a, this, since the early 50s, um, through the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, a lot of the big mega projects that are undertaken that have regional benefit, um, you don't get your funding from the Federal Highway Administration or the state unless you have kind of regional consensus of what the priorities are. We, we don't have that water yet, and I think long term it's something like that's going to have to happen. Mark. Yeah, both your and Mark's uh, presentation appeared that uh, over the last 10 years, reclaimed water has really been utilized effectively in this area, the Central Port. And you've seen the per capita come down or the water use. In the last slide before this one, um, we got that one. You break out um, residential, I assume industrial, everything else is in the upper line. But when I look at that, and we 
you say, you know, I, I'm assuming purple pipe. Well, when I look at that, it looks like residential in that period of time is pretty flat, whereas everything else is coming down, which leads me to believe that Senate Ford has really worked on industrial uses for replanting and others. Is that true? Yeah, I think, Mark, we don't have a, we have another, I think 92% of the reclaimed water in Central Florida is spoken for. Most of that's Orange County and their great, uh, their program there. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of opportunity for, for reclaim. Okay, there is opportunity for reclaim to, re, to redirect it and do some recharge with that and perhaps a, a new supply at some point when the cost makes some sense. You want to ask the question differently? I mean, I yeah, the question that is, I've heard that agriculture is changing in Florida. Citrus, as citrus goes away, um, we're seeing blueberries, peaches, other crops that evidently can be grown in the heat of the summer so that where you have historic